that uh, when we see an answer to prayer, it is a miracle. That's just a wonderful thing to know that God is working like that. And so um, we want to we want to sing a song about that. Nothing is impossible when you put your trust in God. Let's all stand, shall we? Hymn number 615. Nothing is impossible when you put your trust in God. Nothing is impossible when you put your trust in God. Nothing is impossible when you're trusting in His Word. Hearken to the voice of God to thee. Is there anything too hard for me? Then put your trust in God alone and rest upon His Word. For everything, oh everything, yes, everything is possible with God. Again, nothing is impossible when you put your trust in God. Nothing is impossible when you're trusting in His Word. Hearken to the voice of God to thee. Is there anything too hard for me? Then put your trust in God alone and rest upon His Word. For everything, oh everything, yes, everything is possible with God. She's going to play that again while you shake hands and welcome each other. All right, let's do that, shall we? All right, come back to your places, everyone. We're going to have a word of prayer. Please remain standing. Wow. Boy, you know, it's just a buzz of excitement. Everyone's excited about spring fling. By the way, if your children are in the Power Church, they can go on out. Kids, Power Church is already out there. So all the Power Church kids going out right now. Mr. JB starting with you immediately. He's got things he's going to do with you. He's going to preach to you and sing to you. You don't want him singing to you, but he'll preach to you. All right, there you go, boys and girls. Good, good. God bless you all. Going to be exciting. we got the bouncy house out there. We have a water slide. I was talking to a lady I met yesterday. I was knocking on doors, and I met a lady named Mary. And uh, she's about 75. She had a little walker, you know, and I said, hey, we're having a bouncy house tomorrow. You want to be the first to go down there? And she goes, I don't think I can make it down there. And I said, I know. Bring your grandkids. So hopefully a bunch of kids can come. So uh, we're so glad you could be here with us today. God bless you. Got some visitors today. I got to meet a few of you. So praise the Lord for you. Glad you could make it. And um, so we're going to pray, and then uh, we'll go ahead and get started with some other things. Okay, let's ask the Lord to bless me. Father, we love you so much for all that you have done in our life. We thank you for the wonderful blessing it is to be here on this day at this time. You've given us health. Lord, you've given us family. And Lord, we also thank you for providing our homes, our cars, our clothing, and those that love us and those that we love. All these things, Lord, come from you. And we also know, Lord, that you have watched over us in our life. Although circumstances may not always be what we are hoping, we know, Lord, that through them all, you are always with us. At work, when we're time off, at church, you're always there. Thank you for being such a wonderful heavenly father. And Lord, also, I want to thank you for the way that you brought us to salvation. I thank you that 
Lord, we have been able to hear the gospel and the souls that were destined for hell. God, you awakened. You awakened those souls when we believed. And I thank you, Lord, for loving us. And that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And so bless this time, Lord, our visitors, our friends. We just rejoice in you, for you are worthy to be praised. So God, thank you. Thank you for bringing us together to this time. Now, there's, Lord, there's a number that are not here. I pray that you would encourage them, Lord, help them know we love them. And Lord, we wish they were here. Pray that you bless and wherever they are and bring them back to us. And we'll thank you. So Lord, take this time now, we pray and bless it. We ask for your grace in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, you may be seated and take a look over, you, over my head back here. You'll see the bulletin. I uh, was not able to get the bulletin printed this week uh, for you. So take a look up here, a couple things. I know it's hard for some of you can't see far away. I wasn't expecting to do it this way, but a couple things going on. We are continuing on with our Colossians series as well. And uh, this will be one of the last times. We'll be teaching on Colossians today, perhaps next week. But then after that, we have a new series coming up. Colossians is over. Four chapters went real quick. So we'll be doing that. But also today, right after the service is over at 12 o'clock, I'm trying to get done quickly, is we're going to have a gospel release time. We're going to be letting over 200 balloons go into the air holding gospel tracks, and uh, we're going to let them go all over the place. So hopefully, uh, you know, someone will pick up that track, read it, and get saved. Amen. Wouldn't it be awesome? Say amen. amen. Wouldn't it be awesome? So we're going to do that in just a, in just a little bit. And then we have the spring fling. So once the balloons are released, we're going to eat lunch. Now, we've got all kinds of lunch out there for you, those of you that brought your food. Again, it's a potluck lunch. Everybody can stay and eat. The kids, there's tons of hot dogs as well. But we are asking if you are running a booth for Spring Fling or a worker, you will be the first dismissed to go through the lines, eat so you can get out there because the kids are going to be wanting to get out there and have fun. So we want you to guys to go through that first and then get out there and eat. The rest of you, take your time and you can fellowship inside and where it's cool and all that. Okay, so that's going on today. It goes to three o'clock and uh, we're going to have a great time with that there, right? So that's, that's for the day. And then, uh, of course, coming up this week, prayer warriors uh, like normal. I would like to do something about that, our, our, uh, our prayer warriors. On Wednesday night, we need to have a business meeting. What we want to do with that business meeting is we'd like to meet with the church regarding the purchase of a new mower for the church. We've already talked about this a couple of occasions, trying to get people to understand our situation. We have about three acres that we mow right here. We have 11 acres total. Three acres are mowable. Brother Miles takes care of a bunch of it with his bush hog for us at no charge. Uh, but this area up here that's nice and groomed, we do it ourselves. So we need a mower uh, to do that. We've been using personal mower, stuff like that. So the church needs to buy a mower. Brother Adam's going to be able to work out a great deal for us. He'll give us several quotes, and we'll be talking about that Wednesday night. So Wednesday night, we would like to vote on buying a mower. Brother Adam's going to get us lined up real well with that, with a great warranty. I think maybe in a five-year. So all that's going to be Wednesday night. So be here for that if you'd like to participate in that. We have the money for it. We just need to vote uh, for the mower. So that's on Wednesday night. Uh, Friday, brother, do you want to say a word about Friday? No power teens, just kind of nothing going on. Okay, and then um, Saturday, two things are happening. Cross and Crown Cares, that's what CCC is. Uh, we are going to be moving one of our members, Stephanie Plank. Stephanie has bought a new house, and she is moving from one location to the other location here in the area. And she's going to pick up the truck, a big moving tr truck, and she's wanting to move it all at once. So early morning on Saturday, probably 8 o'clock, 9 o'clock, i got to get that exactly right. We'll send you the remind text, and um, you can meet us to help her move uh, one house to another. Okay, that's coming up Saturday. Then in the evening, we're going to meet down at the beach at 6 o'clock. Did it say 6 o'clock? 6 o'clock, we're going to be having a uh, sunset at the beach. You see it, I'm planning ahead that evening. So moving Stephanie in the morning, then anyone that wants to come out to the beach, sunset at the beach, we're going to be meeting around the Fort Pickens area. I'll let you know exactly where. But come out, bring you a sack, lunch, or some dessert, or whatever you want. But just a time for the kids and your family to hang out. We'll bring the volleyball. Uh, if you want to bring some fishing poles, do some fishing. Uh, you can get something to be perfect time right about sunset. You just have a great time together next Saturday night at the beach. So two things on Saturday, moving Stephanie, and then Saturday night, sunset at the beach going on there, okay? 
Um, let's see. Um, and you go on down. Thank you, buddy. Um, Mother's Day banquet we have coming up in just a couple weeks as well. Many of you signed up already. 15 mothers have signed up for the banquet. Uh, it is $15. And so make sure that you put the $15 in the offering and make sure it says uh, your name. And then also it says um, um, for Mother's Day. So if you just put $15 in there, it may or may not go to that. So make sure on the offering envelope, it says Mother's Day banquet and your name. So we know it goes to you. Okay. So $15 per person on that. Now, I did talk to Brother Doug and he's our cook. And I asked him, I said, Doug, what about the ladies that do not want to have? It is smoked salmon. It is a delicious, delicious meal. I've already had it. It's a five-star meal with all the trimmings and stuff. However, someone may not like salmon. So I asked Doug, I said, look, for any of the ladies that do not want salmon, could we throw on a chicken breast, smoked chicken breast? He said, yeah, let's do that. So if you are one of them that says, I don't like salmon, or you know, I just don't even want, I don't want to go for salmon, um, right next to your name, chicken. Okay. And it'll be a smoked chicken breast. He said, he'd be glad to do that. So that's on there. Also, if you didn't sign up because you didn't want salmon, now you can sign up because it's going to be everybody chicken, right? So do that. All right. So as you do that, TJ, would you help us out here? There you go, buddy. And pass that around. And, uh, we're going to get that passed around. So write your name on that, any ladies, and, uh, that's going to be coming up pretty quick. Also, if you are a mother and you have a son or a daughter that's just been born this year, we are having a Mother's Day baby dedication service. So on Mother's Day, on that service, we'll have the, the couples come up with your new baby, whatever it is, a boy or girl. We will have a prayer of dedication. It is not christening. We're not Catholics. We don't do that. But we do have a prayer of dedication for the babies. So that's coming up on Mother's Day. I know we have at least three babies uh, that were born this last year, and uh, we want to do that on Mother's Day. So that's coming up as well. That's going to be a lot of fun. Uh, next week is potluck for lunch. Everybody say potluck. Potluck. So that's going on next week. Uh, also, we have other things coming up. Dr. Hoven will be here. Kent Hoven with Creation Science Evangelism will be here on the 22nd of May. He'll be here Sunday morning, Sunday school, Sunday morning church, and then Monday uh, Sunday night, Monday night, Tuesday night, Wednesday night. It's going to be like six services. He will be here to teach on creation science, all the stuff about dinosaurs and creation and all of that fun stuff, okay? Live and in person. So he will be here for that. Invite somebody out. It's very evangelistic. He always puts the gospel in there. You want to be here for that. We want to fill this place up, okay? We got a lot of you here right now. We got a lot of you missing too, but I'd like to have it standing room only on that day when he is here. 22nd, 24th, 25th, I miss 23rd, 24th and 25th, all the way through Wednesday. Okay, so that's coming up. So don't forget that. Uh, also prayer breakfast, other things going on. You can see all that there. Memorial Day service is coming up at the end of the month. We always have a big day for Memorial Day. Uh, we highlight those who have given their lives for their country. Uh, in the past, those who have died and even now who have lost their lives. It is a Memorial Day for that to remember those who have fallen. So we will be honoring those in the armed forces. So all that's going on coming up as well. So a lot happening there. Go to the next page, Josh. Okay, I think everything has been covered that I can think of there. And so there we are. Now, by the way, that is on the website. So if you ever wonder, I wonder what's going on this week. All you got to do is go to crossandcrownbaptist.com. And when you go to crossandcrownbaptist.com, you can go to our website where it says news. Go to the news button. It'll drop down some other little things and go to weekly announcements. Weekly announcements, then it'll go down to Sunday bulletins. And I put that up there every week. So you see what's going on every week. All kinds of stuff there for you, okay? And that'll get you right on, on track of things. <sighs> Love you guys. Someone said, Pastor, I've never seen you without a tie on. <laughs> well, I'm feeling casual today. Amen. Let's have rushers come forward. We'll take up our offering. Well, let me mention something else to you real quick. Uh, on our phone, I do have the new Remind app. And if you are a member of our church, you're in a category called all members. Public schools do this all the time. I happen to download it, and I'm using it for you. So in order to be able to get um, prayer requests, announcements, stuff like that, all I do is push one button, goes to everybody. I love it. Love it. Okay? It is a two-way, meaning if you want to respond to it, you can respond right back to me. Nobody sees what you say to me. Okay? It's private. Okay? So that's good. Um, but a prayer request, if you have an announcement or a prayer request you want to make, Call me or text me. Pastor, can you have the whole church pray for? And I, I say, sure. I'll, boom, send it to everybody just like that, okay? 
and do it that way. Um, but understand, I, I am very, very picky on what I do that with. I do not want to blow up your phone with texts, okay? Um, so when someone's, I, I do kind of weigh it out. If it's just kind of something that is, is important enough to be a ministry announcement, then I'll put it on there. It may not, I may say, well, you know what, let's not bother everybody with that. So please understand I'm going to have discretion on that. And don't get mad at me, but it's just the way I'm going to work that because I don't want everybody to get a text all the time that you say, I don't need that text. But if it's a prayer request or a serious ministry announcement, that's when I'm going to send that along, okay? Um, and then one thing I did want to mention to you, do you remember Josh and Marcia, Dennis? Remember those guys? Um, they have moved to Lillian. They are in the process of trying to buy a car. I talked to Marcia this week. And uh, they're not in our area anymore, but she said they would come over and do some work. Uh, if uh, anyone needed any work around your house, things like that, um, around your farm with the goats or something like that. But anything like that, she said they would be willing to do any kind of work. They're trying to raise a little bit of extra money so they can buy a car. And so uh, Josh, Dennis, Marcia, Dennis, see me. I'll give you their number. She said, yeah, that'd be fine. And you can call them up as well. Another quick announcement. Uh, my son-in-law, Joe Witherspoon, is now full-time lawn care. He has his own business now, uh, and he's going on by faith. And so uh, he's going to get even thinner until the contracts come in. But what is the name of your company, brother? Pensacola Lawn Works. That just kind of flows. So Pensacola Lawn Works, if you need anything done, landscaping, lawn care, whatever, if you know anybody that does, please call Joe Witherspoon. He does not have a, another job. That is it. He's put all of his eggs in that one basket. And so uh, he is trying to get that up and running. So please help him out. That would be a blessing. He's a good worker. He'll work hard for you. I think even Lisa goes and helps you as well. I think I saw Gabe out there holding a towel one time. I No, that was the that was the burping rag. That's what that was. So anyway, they they work as a family. And so you want to help them out. He'll be glad to go to work for you. All right, let's pray. Brother uh, Titus, would you pray for us, please?
Let's turn over to hymn number 268. Brother Joe, you want to come lead this one? I serve a risen Savior. And after this, Ray's going to come sing for us. Hymn number 268. Let's all stand. I serve a risen Savior. see his hand of mercy, I hear his voice of tear, and just the time I need him, he's always near. He lives, he lives, Christ Jesus lives today. He walks with me and talks with me along life's narrow way. He lives, he lives, salvation to him
Bibles to Colossians now, Colossians chapter 4. We continue on here this morning. Colossians chapter 4. Let's all stand. I want to read just the first six verses to you. You know, with all these uh, folks going through surgeries lately, good to have Miss Beverly back with us as well. Praise the Lord for her and all of the therapy and glad you could make it. Miss Nancy Stewart is with us as well. She's done well and recovering. And so praising the Lord for that. Now, you know, you, you guys, when you go through your anesthesia, you, it's, it's tough. I, how, do you come out of the anesthesia pretty well? Was it hard for you? Kind of difficult? Well, okay. We're not going to go there then, sister. We'll, we'll stay there. I know, I know Wendy, it took her forever to come out of her surgery anesthesia. I heard a, a, funny, a funny story about a guy, and he was coming out of anesthesia, and it was a very strong uh, anesthetic you know, response he had. And when he was coming out, his wife was sitting down next to the bed, and she, he looks up at her, and he's coming out of anesthesia, and he says, wow, you're beautiful. You know, a few minutes go by, and uh, he looked up again and said, oh, you're cute. She's a little disappointed. She said, well, what happened to beautiful? He goes, drugs are wearing off. <laughs> Wrong thing to say. Wrong thing to say. But we know what he means. All right, Matthew, here we go. Colossians chapter 4. Masters. Masters. Now, what do, you, what do we have the word masters for? It's because in chapter 3, at the very end, he's talking about servants and masters. But now verse 1, masters... Give unto your servants that which is just and equal, knowing that ye also have a master in heaven. Continue in prayer, watch in the same with thanksgiving, with all praying also for us that God would open unto us a door of utterance to speak the mystery of Christ, for which I am also in bonds, that I may make it manifest as I ought to speak. Walk in wisdom toward them that are without, redeeming the time. Let your speech be always with grace, seasoned with salt, that ye may know how ye ought to answer every man." You know, we're about to finish the book of Colossians. You can see this is the last chapter, and it's a very small chapter. But as we look at Colossians, I want to give you a message that perhaps because it is the last of the chapter chapters, and it is really the last of the book, and we are in the last times, aren't we? I want to give you a message that I think that might be an encouragement to us to be serious about things. And I'm entitling this, It's Time to Get Real with God. It's time to get real with God. Father, would you help us now? I know there's a lot going on. A lot of people are very busy. And right now, it is very easy to let our mind wander. But God, would you just do a work now with your grace and just flow through us, help us to keep our minds on your word. And Lord, help us to be able to share a message that might speak to our hearts to challenge us to do what is right. Bless the time remaining, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. You know, you've heard people use that term. All right, would you get real? Am I used that before? Am I said that about you? Get real! You know, maybe it's a coach after, you know, the first half was really a, a blowout. And the guys are kind of playing, not really their hardest. And he goes into the locker room and he says to everybody, it's time to get real. Time to stop playing around. Get real. Do what you know is what you should be doing. I know uh, in training and stuff like that, if you are in any type of competition, you know it's time to get real when you know your life is on the line or you know the award is on the line. I think about those who are training for a 5K. Someone told me recently they're going to be running a 5K. One of you told me that you're going to be running a 5K, so I'm really trying to you know, run every, every day, Pastor. And you're getting real. When there's no race to run, eh, I'll just run whenever I want. I'll eat whatever I want. 
you know, you know the guy running down the highway and he, you know, he's running along and he reaches his pocket and he takes out a ho ho, you know, you know, he's eating while he's running. You know, he's not getting real. He's not real, right? But the one that's really getting real is the one that's training hard. There's a race to run. I'm getting real now. Brother Keith, when he rode his 400 miler, he rode about 5,000 miles or 7,000 miles in five months. He just rode and rode and rode to prepare for that. He got real. Getting real basically says, I'm tired of playing the game. And guys, let me just be honest with you. I'm getting really tired of Christianity the way I'm seeing it these days. I'm getting tired of seeing people who know the Lord, they know what is right, they know what they should be doing, and they're blowing it every day. I'm tired of it. Tired of seeing good Christians that could be serving God and being faithful to God and winning people to Jesus Christ, being faithful to church, serving God in a great capacity, but yet you're not real. The attitude is, well, you know, if I have time or if I have a convenient season, then I'll... Why don't you get real? Get real with God? Quit playing around? It's probably a good thing I am dressed casual today, amen? I might be too, too hard on you guys. But it's time to get real. So in this passage, I see a few things about someone who really wants to get real with God. I want to get real with God. I do. I want, I want God's blessings. And I know if I get real with him, I know that he always is faithful to his promises because he's no respecter of persons. And if any one of you would just say, I'm going to get real and stop playing around. I'm going to get real with God. He's going to bless you. So what do we see here? Let's take a look at number one, verse four, or chapter four, verse one. Masters, give unto your servants that which is just and equal, knowing that ye also have a master in heaven. Number one, those who get real with God have a conscience of God. Well, look at that. Good to have you, Teresa. God bless you, sister. Amen. Been a long time. A conscience of God. A conscience of God. Say that with me conscience of God. See, those who get real with God have a renewed conscience of God. Look at verse 1. Masters, give unto your servants that which is just and equal. Stop playing around with false balances, with false payments, with deceitful tactics. Be just and equal. Why? Because you have a master in heaven. Do you realize if you are going to be real with God, that means the practicality of your life, you will be just and you will be equal with others. Why? You have a conscience of God, that he is a master and he is in heaven. You're not on your own. You're not just doing your thing. It doesn't matter. You say, well, it doesn't matter what I do if, if I do this or if I do that. No, 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 no. Listen, if you are truly getting real with God, you will say to yourself, I've got a master in heaven who watches me. And it's important. You have a conscience of God. You let God be your compass. Everybody say compass. I brought one, by the way. You know what a compass is, don't you? Wherever you take a compass and you walk around, where does a compass always point, everybody? North. You ever wondered why? Well, you know that the earth... If you kind of imagine a bar magnet going right through the middle of the earth. Now, it's not exactly in the middle. Scientists will tell you it's kind of skewed. But you go right through the earth. The North Pole and the South Pole have different ends of the magnet. You know, you have one magnet here. You have a positive and you've got a negative, right? What attracts to the negative is the positive. What attracts to the positive is the negative in a magnet. The North Pole has a negative. I believe it's the negative. It's at the north, and the positive is at the south. Now, when you have a compass, you have a little needle, and it's magnetized. It, what happens is wherever, it, wherever you go on that little needle, it's going to be attracted to the North Pole, which is the opposite of what this is because it's going to attract. So wherever you go, it's going to point north. That's way before GPS, right? People have been doing this on the open ocean for many, many years, finding their way when they could not even see one marker to show them where to go. A compass showed them where to go. They had a compass to give them direction. 
If you're going to get real with God, you're going to have to have a God consciousness, and God is going to have to be your compass in life. Two types of compasses. One, a spiritual religious compass. See, some people, they have a spiritual life or a religious life, and they really have no direction in life. You see them because they look spiritual. They go to church on Sunday and they do this and they do that. And yet they really don't even know if they're going to heaven. They don't know if they're going to go to heaven. They're going to go to hell. But man, I go to church. I pray to Allah seven times a day. Right? I beat myself on the back like a good Catholic in the Philippines once a year. I do all the other things religions do because that's what I'm supposed to do. But listen, that compass that you're following is going to send you straight to hell. It's not a God compass. The God compass is very clearly what point you the direction you need to go as far as your salvation is concerned, and that's through Jesus Christ. Can I get an amen? Now, although many people have a compass spiritually, you've got to remember is a lot of people will look at God and know that there is a God, but the problem is their compass is off because their compass is not calibrated correctly. See, the way you calibrate a compass is you've got to have something that has a true, a true calibration effect. By the way, when it comes to a spiritual compass, you know what the calibration is? Is the word of God. Amen? Our God, no matter, everybody believes in God. Most people believe in God, but it doesn't mean that they're following God or that God is going to be their compass. By the way, Allah is not my God. Can I get an amen on that? He is a false God. He is the moon God. He is not Jehovah God, no matter what president says or what other person says. Oh, Allah is the same as the Hebrew word Jehovah. No, it's not. Grow up. Get a brain. Think. It's not Allah. My God has nothing to do with Allah whatsoever, and my God is a great God, a loving God, a merciful God. But how do I know that? Because of his word. The word has to calibrate my compass. And so my God, I follow. I have a spiritual compass. His name is Jehovah God. His son is Jesus Christ. God come in the flesh. And I know that to be true because of his word. And when I allow him to be my spiritual compass, I have direction. Take me straight to heaven through Jesus Christ. I'll talk about that in just a moment. A compass by which to guide your life. But you know what? As a Christian, though, what happens is we lose our way. We lose our way as a Christian. We allow the old man to have power over our life. We've talked about that a lot. The old man can influence us to portray an unrighteous or an unholy manner of life. Christians who get themselves involved in the world philosophy or worldly practices of life. I see Christians who have no problem with drinking. When the Bible is very clear, get this, guys, the Bible is very clear about the problems of drinking. You get that? Very clear. So you understand that. Now, why, why do we do that? Why, why is it a situation where, okay, I'll just go ahead. Other things that are very immoral things. It's okay to, to go to certain places that are R-rated or X-rated or, or pornographic things or things that are loose living, loose, loose living in your life and or even just simply the way that you respond in life as well. It's okay to be a little bit deceitful. I can just lie a little bit on my taxes or I can do a little bit here, a little bit there, and it's no big deal. What has happened to you? Your moral compass now is what we're talking about. Not just a spiritual compass, but a moral compass. God has given us very clear directions about how we are to live our life. And he is our moral compass as well. Do you have a God consciousness? Those that say, I want to get real with God, that means I'm going to let him be my spiritual compass. I'm going to let him be my moral compass. So if he says it in his word, then I'm going to follow that. I don't care what the world says. I don't care if another Christian says it's okay to do this or okay to do that. It's not right. And just because it's legal doesn't mean it's right. Homosexuality is legal. Same-sex marriage is legal, but it is wrong. So I have a moral compass by which I have to follow. The presence of God in our life is a compass that helps us to stay on course and find our way. To find our way. Ask yourself that question. Who is right in the world? Who is right? What religion do I follow? How do I know I should follow those things? What's my moral compass? How do I know what's right? Go back to verse 1 again. Give unto your servants that which is just and equal. How do I know what is just and equal? I've got to have a moral compass, and my God is that compass. I have a consciousness of God. Someone says, well, Pastor, I'm that way because I've got a wristband that says WWJD. Got a shirt that says WWJD. What would Jesus do? 
Can I do it? Great. What Jesus are you talking about? Because not everybody has the same view of Jesus as you do. So how do I calibrate that Jesus? With his word. My moral compass is based on his word. And that doesn't lie. So I may be thinking Jesus one way. I may be thinking God another way. But my moral compass is calibrated right there. I know what the truth is. Okay, that's fine. You do what would Jesus do, but you stay in the Word and make sure that your Jesus that you're thinking of is also the Jesus of the Bible. And you'll be just fine. Okay? So think about now the things in life that we allow in our life. What is just and equal? How do we know? What is the standard? Well, it depends upon who holds that standard, that absolute standard of the decisions of your life. See, people base their decisions upon three things. They, deba- they base it upon themselves, their peers, or their culture. Most unsafe people. They'll look at their culture and say, well, I'll base my decision upon what's acceptable in our culture. So, okay, in our culture, it's okay to kill your baby. What do we call that? Abortion, or I call it murder, right? So it's okay. It's legal. Okay, so my culture says it's okay. So then is it okay for me as a Christian to have an abortion? No. I don't care if the culture says that. That's not my moral compass. Culture doesn't tell me what to do. What about my peers? Now you might have some peers that are your age, you're in school, you public school kids, maybe a Christian school, and you maybe have someone that says, you know, I don't really know if I'm a boy or if I'm a girl. I might be both, or I might be the opposite of what I was born with. All that stuff is going on. Someone sent me a text this week. It says, I guess Target now is allowing men to use the ladies' bathroom. Have you heard this? My peers, my culture says that's okay. Is that okay? Because that's not my moral compass. Myself, my old man, my old man, do what my nature wants. Man, listen, I don't even want to tell you what my nature wants. I'm an old man inside here, and I have all the lust, all the anger, all the appetites of any unsaved man. Can I get an amen? We all have it. Do I want to listen to that old man? God forbid. How shall we sin? Those who are dead to sin. That the grace may abound, Romans 6, 1 says, no way. Why would I do that? Don't listen to that. My moral compass is different. It's not based upon culture. It's not based upon peers. It's not based upon myself. It's based upon God and his word. Amen? That's my moral compass. So you ask the person who is a gay person or someone who is struggling in their life, and by the way, I know it's out there. They're everywhere. What is your moral compass? They have a compass by which they guide their life, culture, their peers, their self. But as a Christian that wants to get real with God, I can't do that. A person that says, I want to get real with God, I got to say, I'm not going to listen to my culture. I'm not going to listen to my peers. I'm not going to listen to myself. That means if my word, the word of God tells me a certain thing, that's what I want to obey. That's how I want to live my life. That's my compass. A God consciousness is what we're talking about here. Man, when a person decides they're going to get real with God and stop playing Christian, they start being a real Christian. God is their moral compass in all things. Man, it starts to change your life. Wow. Have you ever met someone like that? I hope you're the one. You met someone that, hey, he's just Jesus all over him. He's, he's right with God. He, he loves the Lord. Nothing phases him. He doesn't get offended. He doesn't carry a chip on his shoulder. He doesn't just go off on something because it didn't work out his way. No, he's a godly man. He's a patient man. He's loving. He's kind. He's gracious. This guy walks around. He's like Jesus. Everything he does, everything she does, because God is in his conscience. He's a moral guide. So the one that wants to get real with God, the first one we're talking about here, is that he has a spiritual moral compass, and that is God consciousness. Number two, look at verse two. Continue in prayer and watch in the same with thanksgiving, with all, praying also for us, that God would open unto us a door of utterance. Everybody say door of utterance. To speak the mystery of Christ. That is the gospel, by the way. Everybody say gospel gospel to for which I'm in bonds that I may make it manifest as they ought to speak 
See, Paul, now number two is the one that gets real with God is the one that has a God consciousness in all things. You don't play around anymore. Well, I'm okay here, 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 but not this area. No, everything you say, I want God to lead my life. But then number two, the one that gets real with God is not only has a God consciousness or consciousness of God, but number two is consumed, consumed with the gospel. Consumed with the gospel. Everybody say that, ready? Consumed with the gospel. That means that's what you live for. Paul said it this way. He says, for me to live is what? Christ. For me to live is Christ. Woe is unto me, he said, if I preach not the gospel. Is your life filled with that con being consumed with the gospel? See, Paul says to speak the mystery of Christ. It's a mystery. What's the mystery, preacher? Well, the mystery is a wonderful thing because the mystery, by the way, it's still a mystery to a lot of people. The mystery to a lot of people, they, don't, they still don't quite get Christ. Here's it is. Here it is. Out of all the religions of the world, only Christ and his gospel, the true gospel message, is the way of salvation. But yet there's so many other ways that people think that will get them to heaven. And every single one of them, here's a theological thought for you, every single other religion besides true Christianity is this. They want to sanctify you before they justify you. Every other religion wants you to be sanctified somehow before you're justified. What they say basically is this. You have got to do something to sanctify yourself, then you'll get justified. A work. A baptism. An experience. Something that you do, right? Something that you do, something that you accomplish in your life. My, out, my works outweigh, my good works outweigh my bad works. So therefore, because of that, God's going to sanctify me. And therefore, I'm justified in the sight because my good works outweigh my bad. No, 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 no. Not at all. So many religions teach that, whether it be the Mormons or the Jehovah's Witnesses, and everything's a work salvation, a work salvation, downplaying Christ, lifting up your effort. Even the Catholic Church who talks about Christ being God. The Catholic Church talks about a lot of that stuff, him dying on the cross, even receiving Christ. But again, understand this, even with the Catholic Church idea, they still tack on those sacraments, those works of grace that you have to accomplish yourself in order to get justified. Right? Baptism sacrament. Oh, you, know, you didn't get baptized, you ain't going to heaven. You're not, gonna, you're not a Catholic, you're part of the church, you're not going to heaven. Right? Mass, you don't take mass, you're not going to heaven. Last rites, we'll get the priest in there before he dies. It's all about that means, that sanctification thought before you get saved. And that's totally against Christ. What we find in the scriptures, there's only one way to heaven, that's through Jesus Christ himself. And there's no work that we can do. And yet, here's the mystery. The mystery is, wow, everyone thinks it's this way. Everyone thinks it's that way. Everyone thinks it's work, 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 work. But the mystery is, no, no, no. It's a great mystery. Here it is. You don't got to do anything. He did it all. All you got to do is see him on the cross. Oh, Paul talks about in Romans that you treasure up to yourself wrath against the day of judgment because of your impenitent heart. All you've got to come was with a heart condition of penitence towards the Lord Jesus Christ. Not a work, but just a condition of penitence. Oh, I need to be saved. And you see what he did on the cross, and you trust him as your Savior, and salvation takes place. That is a big ministry to a lot of people. And you know what? We are to be consumed with that message everywhere you go. Everywhere you go. You go to the store, you go to the restaurant, wherever you go. Are you consumed with it? Those who get real with God... They have a consciousness of God and they are consumed with the gospel message, that mystery to get it out. Pray, pray always that there might be an utterance, a door of utterance, that I might be able to speak the mystery of Christ. Do you do that? Do you do that? Is it a burden on you wherever you go? I wonder if they're saved. I wonder if I can tell them. Those that get real with God are consumed with the gospel. Number three, look at verse five and six. Walk in wisdom toward them that are without, redeeming the time. Let your speech be always with grace, seasoned with salt, that you may know how ye ought to answer every man. 
The first thing that we talked about is that you have to have a God consciousness. The second thing is that you need to be consumed with the gospel. And then lastly, number three, here it is, constrained by grace. Constrained by the grace of God. You remember the ocean of grace we talked about a while back, some messages ago? Let your speech be always with grace, verse 6. See, the great thing about grace is that when you are constrained by it, it takes over. <laughs> it just takes over. I love to do this to my kids. They're fun. Julia, especially Chloe, they'll sit on my knee. And you ever taken a kid? And I know Adam probably does this. Take your kid, grab him by the hand, and use their hand. You grab it and you punch themselves in the face with their own hand. <laughs> Have you ever done that? <laughs> You're stronger than they are. You're bigger than they are. And I'll grab Julia's hands. I'll say, why are you hitting yourself? She's like, Dad! <laughs> I don't hurt them. We have fun, though. I have fun. But you know what? When you, when you get saved, you're saved by, by grace through faith. Amen? Nothing you did. But then you have access into this grace by faith wherein you stand, Romans 5, 1 and 2. You have grace, right? Access to that same grace by faith. That means in your life, every day, you are in an ocean of grace. We've talked about this. You breathe it in, and God says, let me do it. It's as though he takes those hands, and he's not punching you in the face, but he's got the strength. He can take you wherever he wants. He can use you for whatever he wants because when you yield to his grace and you are constrained by grace, you can do anything for God. Can I get an amen on that? You can teach, you can preach, you can soul win, you can be a godly husband, you can be a godly wife, you can say no to your culture, no to your peers, no to homosexuality. So sad. I was driving back from where we were. Where were we were? Where were we just at? Texas. Driving back from Texas, I was listening to the radio. Weird stations in Mississippi. Wow. And I was listening to the station in Mississippi. And it was a call-in talk program. And it was a Christian station. And they were psych psychiatrists or something like that. I thought, well, I'm sure what they say. This lady called in. She said, um, I need help with my family. She was very serious. She goes, we live in Oregon. My husband is a, is a worship pastor. And I, you know, we've been married for 30 years. We have a 15-year-old boy who's in the ministry his whole life with us. But now says he's gay. What do we do? My heart broke for him. I thought, here are these people in the ministry. I don't know them. I just know what they said. And she says, I don't, we don't know what to do. And I thought, are you raising them the right way? I mean, are you in the Word? I mean, are you praying with them? Are you giving them moral compass direction? What, what, something's not right. I don't know. I, I, I don't know. All I could hear, though, was in her voice, heartbreak. And they actually gave her very good advice. I, I was very, very pleased with what they said on there. But let me just tell you something. There is nothing in your life, your circumstance, no how, how bad it may be, that God's grace cannot fix. Amen can fix it that's the great thing about grace he can fix your life whatever it is just go to him amen brother he can fix it don't you love jesus he's all about fixing your life and he'll do it his way not your way peers or culture his way so you yield to the Lord Jesus Christ, and you say, God, help me. So notice what he says. Walk in wisdom towards them without, without redeeming the time. This is something that you need grace for, walking in wisdom, redeeming the time. See, walking means to walk circumspectly everywhere you go, looking around, watching for something. You know, the first when I, when I, when I got my concealed weapon permit and I started carrying, I started looking at life totally differently than I've ever done before. Not that I'm thinking everybody's going to shoot me. Well, actually, that is kind of in my head. <laughs> but I look around all the time at my surroundings. 
to defend my family. But as a Christian, I'm also watching for the devil. I'm watching for my flesh to fall. I'm watching for things that could cause me to stumble. Because it's the foolish man that sees the evil and passes on. The wise man sees it and hides himself. Walk circumspectly to those without, meaning how you handle yourself. In the context, just and unjust. Show him wisdom through the grace of Christ in your life. Redeeming the time, meaning take every opportunity to do this. That's what redeeming the timing means. Buy it back. Take every opportunity you can. Don't just let it go. As a Christian constrained by the grace of God, as getting real, display, displaying his character, his likeness, his passion, his love to all those who are around, that Jesus Christ is alive. I serve a risen Savior. He's in the world today. How do you know if he's in the world today? Through you. Those that get real with the consciousness of God, consumed with the gospel and constrained by the grace of God. You can do that. Let your speech be with grace, seasoned with salt. What you say should be appropriate, influential toward your God, and full of wisdom, so that you can answer every man's criticism and inquiry as to your life's decision. Boy, those, you know, the world is looking for people who are real Christians, real businessmen, real workers, real housewives, real teachers. And you decide to finally do that, it'll change your life, it'll change their life. All this is done by the grace of God. So it's time to get real. Amen. Let's all stand, shall we? Father, we love you so much, and we thank you.